Welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And my guest today is Luella Bryant, who is an author, a Vermont author, who has just written a book called Beside the Long River, which we're going to talk about today. And Luella allows me to use her name, Ellie. So I'm going to call you Ellie during our interview. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. And you? I'm great. I am so glad that you're taking this time on this beautiful Saturday afternoon to, to talk with me and my viewers about your work over the years and your accomplished career. And, um, and so let's, let's jump right in because we only have a half an hour. So Ellie, talk a little bit about um, who you are, where you come from, what brought you to Vermont, and maybe a little bit about um, who inspired you to do the work that you do. Hmm. Well, I grew up um, about six miles outside Washington, D.C., um, in Falls Church, Virginia. Um, and I, I, it was a wonderful place to grow up because, you know, the field trips in fifth grade were to the Capitol and the White House and the archives and all that. And I thought everyone had that opportunity. Um, and my father was a poet and he taught me to love words. So my bedtime reading was um, Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha and, you know, a lot of um, Coleridge and classic poetry. So I grew up with words in my head and I thought at some point I should write them down. So that's kind of how I got started. And then I moved to Vermont in 1975 um, following, you know, the trail of love that many of us did um, and settled first in um, North Hero, which is a long way from anything. Um, and then eventually um, we found our way to Lincoln, Vermont, where we now live in the woods. And I still feel like a long way from anything, but that's a great place for a writer to write because it's quiet. Um, and maybe you can hear the the snow dripping onto the deck as it melts off the roof. But other than that, um, there's not much noise. And my husband is a hockey player and he's playing pond hockey right now. So the house is quiet. So that's how I got to Vermont. And you were a teacher. You're a teacher. I taught high school English at Mount Mansfield High School for 25 years. And then after I had written a couple of books, I was hired to teach um, at Spalding University in Louisville, Kentucky in their low residency program. So I was able to work from home and then go to Louisville, which is by the way, a wonderful city, um, twice a year for two weeks um, and meet with students and give lectures and lead workshops and that sort of thing. Um, and I did that for 12 years. And now I work as an independent writer or an independent editor um, in Vermont. And right now I'm working for Black Lawrence Press, which is a press in New York. Um, and I'm doing editing for them for just for the month of February. So I'm still working and, um, and enjoying every minute of playing with words. Well, writing is working, right? You know, it, it, it really is hard work. Um, and I keep saying, why do I do it? You know, but um, in, interestingly, Cowboy Code, uh, which was published a couple of years ago, um, took me 20 years to write. And I would write it and then I would change the point of view and change the point of view again. And at that point I had written uh, four or five books um, and I couldn't get Cowboy Code published. And so I, I pretty much gave up and I found a website that said, if you have a book, uh, that you want to get published, uh, put an excerpt of it here and, and we'll take a look at it. And I forget even what the name of the website was. So about six months went by and the publisher Black Rose Writing contacted me and said, we want to read this, the whole manuscript. And I sent it to them and they wrote back and said, we want to publish it. And I said, what, really? Oh, okay. So um, they now have published three books for me and all my books are published through traditional publishers. I don't self-publish because I taught um, at the university level and they frown on self-publishing. So I feel like I've been really lucky in that regard, 
except two of my publishers have shut down. So three of the books are out of print. New England Press went down. And then the publisher of my little picture book, Nordic Press, um, also shut down. And I begged her to keep going. And she said, I'm 83, that's enough. So <laughs> I couldn't talk her into hanging around a little bit longer. Um, publishing industry is changing and um, it can be really frustrating. And I just feel like I've been really charmed with um, my career in publishing. Well, Tracks in the Snow, I, I, I would love to have a copy of your book and may, perhaps maybe you could self-publish the books that, that now are not being published. Um, so Ellie, I would love it if you could go through um, and briefly talk about the books that you've written. Um, I printed them off of your website. Uh, and just tell us, uh, you know, ab about each book and what and what they're about uh, for my viewers who might want to read more of your work other than your most re recent piece beside the Long River. Could you do that for us? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Black Bonnet was actually really a very popular book and it was a finalist for the Vermont Book Award. Um, and this book wrote itself and I don't say that lightly but my son was in eighth grade um, at Ed Edmonds Middle School and um, he had to write a paper and he chose to do it on the Underground Railroad. So I went with him on a, a field trip to the Converse home in Burlington. And we went down to the basement where supposedly fugitive slaves were hidden. And something happened to me in that basement and I heard this voice, I just got this cold chill that you do when there's a ghost in the room. And this voice said, write my story. And I said, I, you know, I'm a teacher, I, I don't have time to write. And I just kept hearing this voice and it wouldn't leave me alone until I sat down and this book poured out of me. So I swear I didn't write it even though my name is on it. Um, and it was a bestseller for New England Press for several years. It's now um, out of print, but I'm in the process of adapting it because it came out in 1996. I'm adapting it as an ebook. And then um, I may go to um, iUniverse or one of those self publishers. Generally, if a book has been traditionally published, you can self publish it under another name with, the, uh, with a note inside that said where it was originally published. And that book was, this is about, um, it's kind of the story of me because I grew up in Northern Virginia and moved to Vermont. And it's the story of uh, a multiracial girl, a mixed race. Um, who leaves a Virginia plantation and comes to Vermont on her way to Canada on the Underground Railroad. So it's kind and of how neat. relevant is how relevant is that story today? And it, um, that's well, that that story caused caused a lot of controversy um, among people who didn't believe the Underground Railroad really existed. Um, and uh, there was a book called uh, Fugitive Slaves, published by. Uh, uh, John Hope Franklin, who argued with me, I met him, uh, we had breakfast together, and he said, white people didn't help black people escape slavery, black people helped themselves. And there's a lot of truth in that. And I think there's, you know, there, there was a give and take, I think both those uh, uh, ideas are true, that blacks did help themselves. And whites, white people also helped them as well, conductors on the Underground Railroad. And there was a new t a TV series that just came out called The Un Underground Railroad as well. Right. So I think right. that story right now is about is an important story. So yeah. how about a few of your the other books that you've written? Well, I also published uh, through New England Press, Father by Blood, which is the story of John Brown and his raid on the Harper's Ferry um, uh, Armory. And the reason I was interested in this book was because um, we used to, when I was a child, we used to take Sunday drives to Harper's Ferry from Northern Virginia and have picnics there. So um, I don't know how I feel about John Brown having been over there and visited his homestead. Um, he, uh, he's still uh, kind of a, a mythical, mystical character. And some people think he was nuts and some people think he was a savior. So my idea is to just tell these stories and find out um, what, you know, who, who was helping in the cause of abolition and who was standing in the way. 
So um, those two books were set, both of them were set um, in the pre-Civil War era. And I'm very interested in that era because my um, great, great, great grandfather uh, fought in the Civil War and he fought for the South, ironically. And that's documented in this memoir called Hot Springs and Moonshine Liquor, which was published by um, Black Rose Writing. Supposedly it's a fun read, everyone says. It's about um, making moonshine and my trying to make moonshine and my drinking moonshine and my ancestors making moonshine. And the picture on the front is Willie Carter Sharp, who is the most notorious moonshine driver, bootleg driver in the history of prohibition. And she finally was arrested. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell her story too before I'm done because it's an interesting one. Um, and then, um, I did write a non, another nonfiction book called While in Darkness, There is Light. And this one is um, about Howard Dean's brother, Charlie Dean, who was killed by the Patat Lao uh, in 1974 in Laos. And he, Charlie was really good friends with my husband. So it's about Charlie's story and these wealthy young men who became expatriates during the Vietnam War and uh, there are pictures of them inside. Mm. And uh, I think this is probably my favorite book, my best book. I mean, here they were, they were all um, prep school boys until they ended up in Australia and then they became uh, sort of hippies. <laughs> there's, I think there's a picture of them in here who, with long hair and bandanas wrapped around their heads. and. Melinda, you probably remember that period, right? I lived it, yes. You lived it, yes. <laughs> well, they lived it in Australia. And unfortunately, it has a really tragic ending. Charlie was executed by the Patat Lao in 1974 after he was held in a rainforest prison camp for three months. And Howard went over there several times to try to find Charlie's remains and finally did find them while he was running for president in 2003. And he wrote the foreword to the book. So um, it's crazy and tragic and there's adventure and um, a lot of sadness. Is but if you lived print? during that time, you would find, you might find this book interesting. Well, or even now, is it still in print? Is that, is it still yes. in print? Oh, good. This is published by Black Lawrence Press in New York. And, uh, and this book is still in print and it's, you can get it on, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any indie uh, uh, bookseller. Um, and I, I really highly recommend this book. It's cautionary. The boys were, Charlie was 24 and the, the Australian boy who was killed with him had just turned 21. So uh, we've all been there. Um, and we know that we make some tragic mistakes and Charlie made a very tragic mistake. So, that's, uh, and then Cowboy Code, which I've talked about a little bit, and that leads us to Beside the Long River. Now, before and, you move into that, um, Ellie, okay. uh, to my viewers, I'm talking to Luella Bryant, who's a Vermont author and writer who has uh, written uh, quite a few fabulous books, uh, which we're reviewing here. I also want to talk a little bit, Ellie, Ellie very quickly about the awards that you've received. Um, you received the 2002 Vermont NEA Human and Civil Rights Award, the Lynn Stenger Kingdom Award in Short Fiction, the Ralph Nading Hill Award for Short Story Relating to Vermont, the Southwest Writers Award for Nonfiction, the Premier Award for Fiction, and the Silver Bay Children's Literature Award. And you were finalists for Vermont Book Award, Dana Award, Ray Carver Award, the Ruth Hinman Foundation Award, Award short story. I, mean, I just get go on the Exeter Award. So you you are an award winning author, and now you're going to share with us a little bit about your new book, Beside the Long River. Take it away. Yeah, uh, it, it seems like um, most of my books relate to um, people who are um, co uh, compromised in some ways people who are oppressed in many ways, um, people who have been victims of prejudice. Um, and my uh, father-in-law, my husband's stepfather, started writing a book about his ancestors and he asked me to help him write it. 
And so I wrote uh, the first chapter, which was about his, the Lyman family coming to the New World in 1632. And um, he didn't like my writing. And so he fired me uh, and <laughs> found somebody else to write his book. And he ended up writing the book and publishing it. And I said, I like this story. The Lymans were uh, a family who came from England and they had um, five children. And I fell in love with the daughter, Sarah, who was a teenager. And I asked Steve if I could, if I could have that story and write it. And he gave me permission. And, um, and as I got into the story about Sarah, and from what I read about her, she was, um, she was feisty and, um, and very independent. She was a Puritan, but she wasn't sure what this whole state of grace was about that you were supposed to achieve. So I thought the idea of the book would be Sarah's attempt to find grace. And what I discovered um, is that the Lyman family went with Thomas Hooker in 1636 to settle Hartford, Connecticut. And in that year, the Pequot Indians were infringing on the Europeans' um, property. And um, they had to be extinguished because they were a threat. Mm -hmm. And I realized that her older brother, Richard, was the age probably to go into the infantry. He was 18 or 19 at that point. And so I sent, I dressed Sarah up as a boy and sent her with her brother to this battlefield and her idea was to stop the execution of the Pequot nation of Indians. And the end, of the, uh, the upshot is in the Pequot war, if you know anything about that, which happened in Mystic, Connecticut, um, 600 Indians were killed, mostly women and children and elderly. The others were taken captive and given to the Narragansetts and the Algonquins as slaves, and the entire Pequot nation was wiped out. Um, and so what I realized was that Sarah had to be involved in this somehow. Um, and the whole idea was of course manifest destiny. The English were on a mission from God to settle the entire continent. And if Indians got in the way, um, they had to be killed. And we know about, you know, the Battle of the Little Bighorn and, um, and all, all of these battles that were just horrific. And we know what's happened to the natives today. So there is uh, the idea of it's, it's time to tell the truth about American history. And this is an ugly truth, but it's a truth that really needs, in my opinion, to be told. And I've tried to tell it in a way that is somewhat uplifting because Sarah at the end does find a state of grace and she rescues this one Pequot brave and they go off together with her younger brother, John, um, at the end of the story. And I don't know, maybe there'll be a sequel to it, but that's... Well, that was, a, that was a question that I had here. Um, so I wanted to ask you, did you have any familiarity with the 1400 English author, Geoffrey Chaucer, in his book, Canterbury Tales? <laughs> Perhaps you can describe how his work is used in this book, Beside the Long River. Well, my, I went to George Washington University and my major was, um, was English literature. And of course I fell in love with Chaucer. And um, as I was writing Beside the Long River, a friend gave me a copy of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which I hadn't read since, since college. And I thought, well, what if Sarah had a copy of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales? And there are all sorts of stories. They're on this you know, pilgrimage. And the Lymans actually take a pilgrimage from the Massachusetts Bay Colony where they began to Hartford, Connecticut. And so I send her on a pilgrimage. And so the book is, is peppered with quotations from the Canterbury Tales. And a lot of the Knight's Tale is about, um, it's about war and fighting. So I found a lot of similarities in places where I could plug in those, those quotations. And I tried to use Chaucer's English. And then as E.B. White does in Charlotte's Web, you sort of have her interpret what that 
Old English actually means. So um, I, I hope that's effective. It's beautifully done. I think, I think it gives a little depth. To the, so beautifully the done. So Ellie, you paint this era of the 1600s so realistically. Can you explain how you were able to do that? Well, because I majored in Elizabethan literature um, and earlier than that, um, you know, I could scan uh, a Petrarchan sonnet for you right now. Or in, a, in fact, two of my, uh, two of my, I don't think I told you this, two of my English, two of my Elizabethan sonnets were actually chosen to be included in an anthology uh, published by um, a bookstore in Connecticut. So I write sonnets and I love sonnets and, um, uh, and I, I just feel like part of me actually is, is, has lived through that era because I was so immersed in it when I was in college. So I was really eager to do this story, which gave me a chance to talk about the, the clothing and um, especially about some of the early American ways of life, you know, how they survived and what they had to deal with, like the wolves taking their chickens at night and, um, and how they dealt with the Native Americans who sometimes the Native Americans were really helpful to them. And sometimes they felt, some people felt threatened by them. So um, that of course was not part of my Elizabethan studies, but um, to, to think of the, the English putting themselves in this foreign territory it was like a Virginia girl moving to Vermont, the mountains of Vermont. You know, how do I, I'd never, you know, I'm a city girl right. and here I am living in the woods and, you know, there are bears and coyotes out there and it's pretty scary. So I could identify in many ways with what Sarah was feeling. So Ellie, would you like to read, read something for us from your book? Yeah, I'll read a little bit. How much, how much time? Oh, we've we got have? another 10 minutes, five, okay. 10 minutes, sir. We've I thought I'd just read a couple of pages from um, when they first get to Connecticut. And Sarah, uh, she had come from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So this was a new idea. And this gives you an, uh, uh, an indication of where I came up with the title of the book. It's called The Connecticut Valley. Because of the wide river that flowed from the far north to the ocean on the southern coast, Reverend Hooker had given our new territory the name Connecticut after the Algonquin word Quinnitucket, meaning beside the long river. Our new town he named Hartford, the place where hearts or deer forded the river. Over the coming weeks, I would come to know the river. Boston's Massachusetts Bay was salt water, but here the river carried fresh water, excellent for irrigating farmlands. Deep and wide, the river offered us sturgeon and freshwater mussels, which if we competed with otters for them, had not the sweet taste of the mussels we dug from the mud banks in Boston, but filled us nonetheless. Falcons and white-faced eagles built nests along the shore, and if I hadn't had field work, I could have spent an afternoon watching them dive for fish. Years before we arrived, Dutch traders built roads and a fort to protect against Indian attacks, Reverend Hooker told our group. He said to beware of the Pequot, a warring tribe that claimed much of the territory we aimed to settle. Papa said we were on a divine mission and the Lord would protect us. He had better be right. We set to work clearing and spent the summer planting and building houses to make a village. I had thought Connecticut would give me respite from hard work, but what did I have to show other than strong arms and calloused hands? Although money was not worth much in our new settlement, Papa purchased two cows and a bull from another colonist. If the cows had calves, we would have milk and butter and could start to build a herd. In the meantime, we each depended on others to lend muscles. Richard and John learned building skills and neighbors grateful for help with their own houses paid them in eggs and cheese. Our house occupied the south side of Buckingham Street, the fifth parcel of land from Main Street. Through two glass windows, dawn blazed out of the east in the early mornings. The glass was full of ripples and bubbles. And in the evenings, I tilted my head and watched the moon change shape as if it were alive. 
The slightest breeze made the trees wiggle. The meadows and woods surrounding Hartford were as untouched as they must have been when Adam and Eve were cast, cast from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Ellie, that's so beautiful. Now, I, I, I have a couple more questions. Thank you for reading that for my viewers and for me. So were Sarah and Ajax, I think it's pronounced Ajax, is that correct? Ajax? I think so, yeah. Ajax. Ajax. Were they an actual couple recorded in the Lyman genealogy? I know. They weren't, okay. No. okay. He, was, he, he was actually a fiction of my imagination. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I have a picture of what I think he looked like and he was pretty, pretty good looking. But I thought since Sarah, Sarah's friend that she left in, um, in England was of marrying age and in, in the Elizabethan times, girls married as young as 14. And by the time you were 18, you were considered, you know, an old maid. And uh, at the end of the book, she's 16. And I think she might be looking for love. And um, I don't know, at some point, um, uh, I, I think in actuality, she didn't marry until she was in her early 20s. So she was determined that she was going to do things her way. And I think um, it, making her love interest a Native American suggests that she was willing to go against the Puritan traditions of you know, not marrying for love, but marrying for convenience or money or whatever. Sarah would, would want to fall in love. And I think Ajax was probably the guy. So my last question then. They did not, or they did not actually end up together. Well, my, la <laughs> my last question is, if you were going to follow up and continue this story of Sarah and Ajax moving back to Boston, how would that story unfold and what and would that society have accepted them? Or do you think that they might have gone back to the frontier to find their place? You know, that, that's a really excellent question and one that keeps me awake at night. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine that Ajax would have been accepted into Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, I think maybe, I know that Sarah settled around the Boston area, maybe a little north of Boston, um, and perhaps they could have found uh, or established a homestead somewhere away from the colony itself. Um, but I have a feeling there would be a tragic end to Ajax. I can't see any other way of making that ending happy. It just was not, it was not going to work if I were going to be true to what really happened to Sarah. Um, I can't imagine that they would have just been, they would have parted friends. I can't imagine that he would have been accepted. Um, the Algonquins would have taken him prisoner. Um, they're, they're, you know, and so many of my stories are dark. I really want to write a comedy. <laughs> my next book. Well that's, have, well, that, well, that's my next question as we come to the end of our, of our interview here, um, Ellie, is what is your next project? What, is, what, what are you going to start working on now? Well, um, beside the Long River, you know, I kill 600 people. Um, in my next book, which I've just finished, and I'm, uh, I'm looking for a publisher for it now, um, I kill 1,500 people. Well, you don't kill is... them. Well, you, well, I guess maybe you do, but... <laughs> They're already dead. That's what I tell my husband. His great-grandparents were on the Titanic in first class, and the story goes that um, she got into a lifeboat, and it was women and children only. And her husband, his great great grandfather, his great grandfather, um, stayed on the ship. And he went down with the ship. And while she's in the lifeboat, she sees her steward swimming toward her. And she pulls him into the lifeboat and saves his life. And they became lifelong friends. Um, and what I discovered from researching this book is that their ancestry dates back to the th early 1300s in Scotland. He was a Cunningham and they were Cummings and their clans were allies against Robert the Bruce. And so there is sort of a mystical connection that happens in this book. Um, and this has been 10 years in the writing 
it's not, I don't think it's meant to be a young adult book, but. Um, what is the title? Do you have a title yet? Uh, I'm calling it Sheltering Angel because there's an old Scottish proverb about a sheltering angel um, guiding you and protecting you. And uh, Andrew, the, the steward, feels the sheltering angel as he's swimming in the water toward this lifeboat in 28 degree water. Um, and then he becomes uh, his, uh, Florence's sheltering angel as well. Wow. So that's, that's the working title of it. That's beautiful. Well, Ellie, you know, we've come to the end of this show. Uh, to my viewers, um, I want to send you to Ellie's website. It's LuellaBryant.com. LuellaBryant.com. And you can learn more about Ellie and her work and her life. It's a beautiful website. Your books are fabulous. Um, it's, it's a page turner. Couldn't put it down. Um, it's been such a delight to get to meet you and to know you. And after you finish your next book, I hope you'll come back to my show, onto my show. Oh, thank you, Melinda. I would love to. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Interview. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye to my viewers and I'm going to end and I'm going to end the recording, but I'm going to ask you to hang on with me and stay with me, Ellie, because I want to, I want to wish you well to all my all right. viewers. What a beautiful sunny Saturday it is on this February, I believe 26th. And uh, you all go out and have a beautiful day in the snow that we just received here in Vermont. It was a real blessing. Take care to my viewers and I'll see you shortly. Bye-bye.